Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. The world we live in today, I don't think anyone can argue, is suffused with numbers, with data, with information. Data and information come at us from all directions, right? Whether we're reading a newspaper or magazine, looking at something online, watching TV, scientific papers. And the thing about numbers and data is that they have this aura of objectivity, right? Like there's a number, you can't argue with it. It's giving you some information that could be false, but as long as the information is reliable, it's telling you something objective about the world. But the reality is that the way that we present that information visually, whether it's in literal series of numbers or a chart or a graph or whatever, matters. It affects how we process the information, what seems important to us, what is it that we notice, what is it that we care about. So sometimes you want to do your best. I hope that usually you want to do your best at conveying information clearly and vividly and concisely. Sometimes maybe you want to fib a little bit, right, and hide the parts of the information that you're not that proud of. But one way or the other, it matters how it is presented. So the art and science of presenting information is very important in the modern world. And today's guest is the guy when it comes to the display of quantitative information. Edward Tufte uh, is uh, the author of the classic book, namely The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, the really pioneering text that help people understand the importance of graphs and charts and how they are presented in the way to do it well. And since then, he has continued to try to educate as many people as possible about thinking clearly and presenting those thoughts clearly in a visual form. He has a new book out called Seeing with Fresh Eyes, Meaning, Space, Data, and Truth. And once again, it's, it's an exploration not just of how to present information, but the meaningfulness of that information. One of the big things that Edward pushes is that the origins of quantitative information as a way of talking about things, you can trace back to, let's say, Galileo, for example. And it's not just a new way of presenting information, but a new way of thinking, a new way of arguing for a conclusion based on evidence rather than just words giving you an argument, a shift from rationalism to empiricism, if you like. And in the new book, we talks a lot about truth. There's a lot of physics diagrams in there, as well as a lot of works of art, which give you a different kind of truth. So it's a real pleasure to talk to someone who is, is truly a major transformative figure in their field and just listen to the wisdom that he has to offer. So let's go. Edward Tufty, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Uh, welcome. Good. I do want to start with the sort of obvious caveat slash apology, which is that you're the world's expert in data visualization, and we're doing an audio-only podcast. So I, <laughs> I do understand that it would be even nicer if you could you know, point to things, but we'll have people check out your books and so forth. You have a new book out. Why don't, you, why don't we give you that chance to mention that? Okay. Um, it's uh, volume five in this uh, series that started in 1983 with the visual display of quantitative information. And this is the fifth book. Uh, the title is quite immodest. Mm. Seeing with fresh eyes, meaning, space, data, truth. <laughs> and I can't think of a grander title, but I, I, I kind of set it as a goal as I was writing. I had to talk about all this stuff with this, this the, the title. And, um, but that's exactly what it's about. Yeah. It's, it's uh, redesigning everything. Sentences, paragraphs, Feynman diagrams, everything. Sculpture. Uh, and um, uh, that requires uh, the scene with, with fresh eyes. Um, I, have, I open the book with a, a little bit of free verse. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of describes it and also describes me, if it's all right. I Please, think. would love it. Um, this is a, a free verse. It's called The Thinking Eye. To see the ordinary so intensely that the ordinary becomes extraordinary, becoming so focused, so specific about something, 
that it becomes something other than what it ordinarily is. Always on, thinking eyes see intensely, actively, skeptically, scan globally, focus locally, see at varying scales of space and time, approximating ways through multiplicity, detecting how things happen, move, act, interact, seeing with fresh eyes, vacation eyes. I love that. I mm. love the vacation eyes that we, <laughs> we have about, you know, the first five days at a place. It just seems so like a wonderful, fresh, fresh eyes. Um, seeing with fresh eyes, vacation eyes, unhindered by self-confirming words, models, expectations. Not seeing something different is not seeing anything at all. Grace Hopper saying, the most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it this way. Staying in optical experiences, forgetting the name of what one sees. This is a very important idea about seeing with your eyes, not seeing with, your, with words. Uh, once you have the words, it's impossible to see around them. It's very important in sculpture, for example. If you, uh, if you walk out and see a, a, a big thing and people say, oh, it looks like Stonehenge, hmm. or it looks like this, or it looks like it was, it, uh, somebody bought it for a million euros in Zurich the uh, last week at an auction. You can't see it any other way. And so the, that's, this, the scene has got to be free of words because the words will dominate what you see. So staying in optical experience, forgetting the name of what one sees, laughing playful eyes, shut up and look. If you see something, say nothing. Defamiliarize, decontextualize, recontextualize, reform, remodel. Thinking eyes are of this world, empirical, specific, practical, self-aware, asking, disbelieving, challenging, making the familiar unfamiliar. How do you, I, they really know that? There's a little stack list in the middle. How do, in a sentence then, vertical, you, I, they really know that? How could you, I, they possibly ever know that? That is, how could you design a research? You know, could you even design a piece of research that would enable you to own it? Thinking eyes reason intensely about what they see, reason about verbs, links, mechanisms, connections, dynamics, reason about what things do, not what things are named, reason across multiple time horizons, now, then, forever, name, rename, remodel, thinking eyes compare, model, choose, doubt, decide, compare again, thinking eyes act, Make something of seeing and reasoning. Discover, produce, construct. Write a report. Make an artwork. Teach a class. Have an insight. Understand, explain, show. Get on with it. To produce, construct, model, remodel. To act is essential. It is the difference between spectator and player, between consumer and producer between art chat versus art work, anecdote versus evidence, process versus outcome, retrospective versus prospective, presentations pitching versus demonstrations comparing. Craig Venter saying, good ideas are a dime a dozen for a smart person. What distinguishes good from great is how an idea is executed, how it becomes reality, Thinking ideas, thinking eyes, identify, know, celebrate, excellence, forever, universal knowledge, gathering consequences, say, staying in place beyond memories and precision, seeing, learning, doing, doubting are the meaning of intelligent life. I like that. Thank you. I feel like I should applaud a little bit for the performance. Thank you. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll say that. I love the word truth appearing in your subtitle because that's what hit me over and over again, sort of reading through all your books over the decades and thinking about what you're doing. There's the sort of down-to-earth operational side of making a beautiful chart. And then there's the 
much more profound question of discovering truth, presenting it, and conveying it. And it, it, that's really the motivating factor, yeah? It's, uh, uh, it's what it's all about. Um, it's uh, um, in any good report or presentation, it's about the, uh, uh, about the content and the credibility. Uh, it's not about whether you should uh, uh, do a certain motif or use a certain method. It's about the content and the truth of it, the credibility. Uh, and that's, what, that's what's going on in information exchange. Uh, and this, this kind of stuff about the coding for visualization and all that, I regard that as plumbing. Hmm. <laughs> because the really, the, it's plumbing, basically. And the, 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 the reason we're having the reading that, that research report or that we're having this meeting is to reason about content and assess the credibility of the material. That's what that's the fundamental thing it's it's all about. And all the kinds of things I did early on, there was this um, concern with um, with getting it right, getting it true. Uh, but it's really as I become um, more general and applying to more and more things, uh, truth comes right along with it. Mm. <laughs> uh, and you know the the plumbing may d differ, but it's content. And then are are they saying something true? I have a long chapter on medical research in uh, the new book, and it's widely agreed by editors of the New England Journal of Medicine, by editors of the Lancet, and by uh, the, the famous skeptic John Ioannidis at Stanford that uh, most published medical research findings are false. And the debate isn't over whether that's, that statement is true or false. The debate over is, the debate is over the word most. <laughs> and so in a field, uh, uh, it, it appears to be at, at least 50% in medical, published medical research. And this is by people who've been editors of journals. Yeah. Um, and it varies by, by fields. Um, in in some fields, I I, um, I I did the Ig Nobel Prize awards this this year. Love those, yeah, yeah. And um, I did twenty four jargon words about um, cognitive psychology, and then you have seven short words at the end. So I went through the jargon about parameters and blah 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 and so on. And then the the punchline is um, that. Um, the first day in the class in cognitive psychology, the professor says, um, half of the findings in our textbook are false. We just don't know which half. <laughs> and, and so it's, a, it's, it's part of the failure to replicate, the, re the replication process uh, thing. Science has it easy. Uh, um, rocket science compared to social science or even medical sciences is easy because you've got a guarantee of the truth. There is truth in the laws of nature, and that makes it easy. You know there is truth. You don't even know whether truth exists for the, you know, about a lot of uh, pub, uh, personal uh, uh, people people things uh, or medical, medical things. And so um, uh, rocket science is easy. I, I say it all... I say it all the time. I tell people that physics is the easiest science. That's why it's so intimidating because it's so easy. We've learned so much about the physical world. It's extraordinary, and, it's, and also it's the only thing that's universal. Hmm. It's, it's everywhere. That, that's I mean, just out. That's out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> so let me give. Let me let's make sure that uh, the people, the the, you know, the tiny percentage of listeners who aren't already familiar with your work, sort of get the thrust of it right from the start. I mean, you, you work at the intersection of data and design, and you know, design is a is a tricky thing. Do you have any any training in design, or is this something that you just built up along the way, uh, or you stumble into it, or was that a goal all along in your career? Um, my parents, my mother was a professor of English, uh, and uh, did some scholar, uh, scholarly work on the 17th century. Uh, but she also, um, uh, uh, wrote a book, which I then published, I myself published, or I published my mother's book mm -hmm. called Syntax's Style. Um, it's called, um, um, Artful Sentences, Syntax's Style. 
And so that was kind of the word part in my home. My father was a civil engineer, mm. which is very applied science. There you and go. And out, outdoors. And that helped me a lot in my sculpture, of course. And they both could really see well. I don't know where that came from, uh, but they could really s notice things and see well. And I was taught to see well, uh, both in reading things and, and reading poetry and looking at pictures and talking to my mother, but also being outdoors with my father. And so we'd be take a vacation, we'd drive toward Hoover Dam uh, in the middle of uh, the Colorado River and study the dam because my mm. father was a civil engineer. Or every time it rained, uh, we would go out driving to see the storm drains spouting up the wrong way. So it was an intense scene was just part of it. Interesting. Um, and I married the famous graphic designer, Inga Druckery, who was a professor at Yale and uh, uh, RISD and uh, the um, University of Arts in Philadelphia. And um, I, I learned a lot from her. Uh, and I found design very easy. And uh, within, uh, as soon as I did my book on visual display, I was teaching in the Yale Graduate School on uh, in design. Okay. So it, well, it was good enough. <laughs> Didn't uh, need to have a degree. Uh, because I had done the design for the books right. by working with a book designer. And the rest of the books I've designed entirely myself. And frankly, I found design very easy. Hmm. Um, I think it was because of my verbal skills. Uh, I think many designers are like violinists or um, there's a kind of innate quality of seeing and working with your hands and making things. Um, and it's not so much, it's a kind of almost a physical performance not so much an intellectual performance. Mm -hmm. so there's a real difference there. It's a seeing performance, not a word performance. That's a better way to put it. And I'm not. Um, I'm. Um, I'm a, a, a B plus in a lot of different fields. I'm. I'm an A plus in in visualization, but a lot of the subfields like writing, design, uh, statistical work, and all this. I'm. Um, I, I could uh, uh, probably teach an you know, introductory course you know, at a good school. <laughs> it's not, uh, and, and I can use, but I have these tools that I can use you know, all the time that I, uh, I, I can do everything myself, within myself. Yeah. Uh, so the books I design myself, I publish them myself. I love the craft and the, the, the former craft of doing books yeah. uh, with the computer screen. It's not like that anymore. Uh, and so it just somehow c came in this odd package of genetics and school and never specializing. Right. That was, that's actually, that was the key thing. I got a bachelor's and master's degree in statistics from Stanford, PhD in political science at Yale. I was a, a good, a, a good political scientist. I was a full professor by age 31. At uh, at Princeton in political science, but it was quantitative. Oh, I was yeah. leaping over to graphics, you know, more and more. Upset in the politics department, you know, why I'm supposed to be doing this and what's with this graphics stuff. And I think I always wanted to be a professor, you know, from about age 12 on. But I have yet to discover a professor of what. Right. Uh, I I thought I taught in the Yale Law School. I taught in design. I had tenure in public affairs at Princeton. I, I had appointments in statistics. Um, and maybe I, it's because I have a short attention span. But I, I love going into a discipline and looting it, not, not getting a, a, uh, you know, a degree in it, but rather looting what was useful for me. And I get in a completely different posture when I talk to people in other fields who were, and I've always been attracted by excellence. Mm -hmm. I hang around excellent professors when I was a student, regardless of what they were excellent at, uh, and seeing how they think and 
just being with them was happy. And it's the only time I really shut up. <laughs> it's when, when, you know, in this environment where there's all this stuff to be learned. And I just say, interesting. And, oh, well, that's interesting. And maybe say, you know, guide them slightly ever, maybe say, why is that once or right. twice every few minutes? But I just love that kind of discussion where I have no responsibility except to listen and guide it just enough to, to do it. And um, it's, I think, when I'm happiest. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a stranger in all these contacts, but I'm so taken by it. And because I did the data stuff, I could, I could play in just about everybody's backyard. So let me, let me if, if it's okay, get down to some nitty gritty, because I do want to make sure that every uh, listener to the podcast comes away making slightly better charts <laughs> than they did coming in. I mean, we live in a world where there's graphics and, and data visualization all over the place. It, it, this is probably an unfair question, but what do you think is the biggest flaw or the most common mistake in how people make charts and, and present their data these days? Multiplicity. Okay. They uh, try five times, five different graphics or maybe 10, they have a programmer mm. that does us something special and they cherry pick the results. And my first piece of advice to any researcher is use utterly conventional graphics that are in the very best, pay, very best graphics in your field. Mm -hmm. And you specify those graphics in advance. You can't search through, you can't cherry pick. Things are so bad that in medical research, in, in clinical trials, RCTs, randomized con uh, uh, trials, they have to specify their graphics before they see the data. Wow. Because everybody was cheating, <laughs> cherry picking, because most everybody is doctor confirmation bias. Sure. All researchers are, have, a, have a little bit of confirmation bias in them. Of course they do. The real giveaway is that in the, the, a study is cheated, is that they'll have an unusual custom graphic. Hmm, interesting. Not a conventional graphic. And they're so proud of it that the title of their paper is Ending Metastasizing in Cancer by the Use of Artificial Deep Intelligence 6.CP2. So they're pitching their finding and their contribution that they've also made to graphical things. <laughs> that is the sign of a fraud and somebody who's cheating. If they have a, any kind of decent substance finding, it doesn't matter the plumbing. They're trying to say, well, I brought this thing into the field. I, I used to referee all kinds of, of papers. People would say, graphics for sociologists Graphics for psychology, you know, and they would, you know, think, what bullshit, you know? <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, uh, the principles of graphics are, the, are uh, in, are, don't come from the field, they come from the problem, the data problem to be done. Right. And, and so you do whatever it takes in any field. You know, what graphics did you use in psychology? Whatever it takes is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, not that we have some kind of special things. So the, the, the giveaway is an unusual uh, charting method, often custom. So are you thinking about something like, you know, pie charts versus histograms versus line charts? Is that, that the difference of choices that we're thinking of here? No, we're thinking of, of uh, scientists, more scientific serious things. Okay, but what are the kinds of choices that you're saying people make uh, to sort of cheat a little bit? Oh, um, they take, uh, they they put things on, they put a Y on a logarithmic scale. Ah, okay, yeah. They, that, that's the, the um, and there, there are good reasons usually for it, but not always. Um, if there is a doubt, they should show both. That's how you get around it. Mm -hmm. Your findings survive both transformations. Um, 
it's uh, the conventionality is also good because the person has come there to learn about uh, that that uh, cancer can metastasizing can be stopped. They haven't come to learn about your your graphic, right? And you want to minimize. You want them to to your readers to see the data instantly, not decode a graphic, not have little color codes like R does endlessly. Um, Python is better on that, um, um, and so use conventional things. Just as you used, there's a, all kinds of conventions about the language that you use in published papers. They're conventional things. Just get, you know, get it all, get all that out of the way, and that now allows cross research comparisons. Um, and people who are shopping around for something new are thinking they're making a contribution. Look, Don Knuth did it 25 years ago. Okay, <laughs> that's true. Of every, that's true of everything, by the way. Yeah. He did my spark lines, which I was so proud of. He did something called skyline, skylines, like little things post for you know silhouette skylines in a online uh, an inline graphic, and it really was twenty five years before my spark line. But it's true, everybody will once they hear that they'll say, "Yeah, that's right." I mean, maybe tell people what a spark line is for those who haven't heard of it. It's an inline graphic, so it's. Uh, uh, like a word in line, and it has a resolution of typography, mm. which is an intense resolution of letters. So it's very high data, and it's embedded in the text itself uh, and shows lots, lots of it, and it's perfectly readable. And it's the highest res if you If you can operate at, at a graphic at the resolution of typography, you're in the big leaks. And so that's the metaphor. Instead of a word, it's a graphic. It's words like sized. It's built right in. Uh, and, and you have a bunch of these, and now you have what's called a table uh, of lines like that with consisting of words and numbers and also maybe little tiny images. Mm -hmm. I first got the idea from Galileo. Pretty good. I've gotten a lot of ideas. <laughs> or when he discovered uh, the rings of Saturn. And he says, Saturn looks like this. And there's this little charming picture, little drawing, line drawing, that the printer had to hack through out of the lead, make a special Saturn letter kind of <laughs> there. And you can see how it was kind of done roughly. And it's, it says, Galileo says, so Saturn looks like this. And two lines later, he says, on a cloudy night, it looks like that. So comparison of, of a clear and a cloudy and you could, you know, kind of, there was a difference. And it's right there in front of you. And it's perfect. You don't need it. It's working at, you know, you can barely see them himself. And I, I, that's showing up and kind of seek quietly. And I think all five of my books, I have Galileo huh. Satchel. Yeah. Because it is so wonderful. He is such a visual person. And, and, and just seeing. And he is the person who saw... More than seeing, he said, we now have the evidence of the eye, not the evidence of the church sitting around in armchairs, parsing Aristotle and parsing the Bible about astronomy. And Galileo knows exactly what's happening. He says, we now have the evidence of the eye. We have visible certainty. And ding, ding, they're all about truth. And, well, and and empiricism, right? I mean, I, I noticed that and, connection yes, also. It's, it's, it's seeing yeah. the evidence of the eye, not the evidence of words and of uh, churches and all the rest. Uh, do, and do he's think, very blunt about it. I mean, I, I've I've almost quoted well, that what he said, and that's been the spirit of since book two. Galileo showed up in the second book, and. Galileo Saturn gets in every book. It's about, <laughs> it's about the it's about empirical evidence of the of his eyes, and uh, he is just a piece. He's just beyond everybody. He's a, you know a mutation of a mutation. He's, he's so he's so incredible. He was pretty good. I, I do I do admit that. And <laughs> the, I mean, there's a flip side, right? I mean, there are graphic 
choices that, as, as you alluded to, kind of make things worse, kind of hide what you care about. And, and one of the other things, again, going back to the truth issue that I noticed in, in reading the books is this idea that good graphic design just flows naturally from clear thinking about what are the causal relationships, what are the variables that matter. Like if you really think super duper clearly, maybe your graphics will pop out the right way. Is that an exaggeration or do you think that's more or less right? This is from uh, the green book uh, the, with the dog on the cover. <laughs> Beautiful evidence. And I wrote exactly about that. The purpose of an evidence presentation is to assist thinking. That's the key thing. Thus, presentations should be constructed to assist with the fundamental intellectual tasks of reasoning about evidence, describing the data, making multivariate comparisons, understanding causality, integrating the diversity of evidence, and documenting the analysis. Those are the principles of seeing evidence, but they are also right now just turned into principles of analytical design. Hmm. The point of a display is to assist the viewers the reasoning about it. I can tell you what reasoning about data is. I turn them into design principles. So your design principles are, you know, show the data, show multivariateness, show mechanism causality, show an integration of different kinds of evidence, and provide documentation. This is a very powerful idea that people don't think about, don't realize. They talk about, you know, why we should use this method, whether we should use bullet things and stuff. No, you go deep down, you're trying to support the thinking of the viewer and understanding the data. And I can tell you what data thinking is and turn them into principles. This is a, it's, it's a big idea because it's making now a, a, a more of a science of this. These are principles of, of scientific inquiry as well, right. too, when you're showing the, that. And so the principles, this is the grand principle of, of analytical design. The principles of analytical design are designed from the principles of analytical thinking. And people don't act like that. <laughs> they say, oh, hey, we can do donut graphics. We can do donut graphics now. Well, how does that uh, help the thinking of right. the viewer? Does it testify to causality? Does it make comparisons? Does it you know, tell the truth? And and so it it makes it a completely different thing. Rather than, oh, the new R has donut graphics in it. It gets to be the field now, unfortunately, of data visualization is becoming more about itself mm -hmm. than about helping people understand data. It's like the economics department is about economics, not about the economy. That these things become about themselves. And this is what's happening in the packages, and they're comparing each other, and they make, you know, they, they often, you know, get the lowest common denominator, so everybody has a donut. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a sin. <laughs> that, here, my advice for everybody, the, the 200th publication of logistic regression is um, that every major graphic should have a package insert with it, like drugs do, phar ph pharmaceutical drugs, and that they have warnings. <laughs> um, for example, uh, uh, never make a causal inference from logistic regression, regressive multivariate. Okay, and that's a, that is so serious that there's a black box around it from the FDA. <laughs> I, I, wrote, I wrote that up in my new book. And that should come, box plots, for example, are an enormous censoring of data. It's called binning, and it's yeah. two-dimensional binning when you have a row of box plots. And they drug companies hide stuff all the time mm. with box plots to show the data dots. Show the that's data, yeah. And so, because we have high resolution screens now, we can see the data. We don't have to use these summary things. And so the box plots things don't don't trust anybody who's using them because they have cherry picked the, those like crazy. They choose the bins, they choose the fact that there's a box plot, and they can find fake breaks, turns, ups and downs, which are, require a whole lot more data to 
model that to 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 have to have to to go up and to you know start having a, a polynomial thing instead of just a straight a straight line uh, yeah. and it's uh and so you get these cheap things there's a plateau if it happens at this point when they're <laughs> taking the drug you know and we have to add a whole lot more there um the thing i've most discovered from a viewer's point of view um is most strongly in the new book uh, where I spend 40 pages on medical research mm -hmm. from a statistical side. And we've got, uh, we've got to be inherently deeply skeptical of human research because of the replication crisis, because of all the false papers and medicine, of a lot of cheating with the West, with the bluff, the I don't know if you know about this, the, the reading of blot, uh, Western blot tests, and they Photoshop the same blots in several times. And in some molecular uh, biology journals, it's uh, the, the Photoshop shows up in like 4% of the published papers. Oh, yeah, okay. Really faking things. <laughs> yeah. And so I used to believe very strongly, I did quantitative political economy, election predictions and all that kind of stuff. And it's, uh, and I believed in it more. I was doing it, and and uh, thankfully most of my papers got replicated. <laughs> I didn't cheat that much, um, but the fact that it's medical research where there's so much, there are lives at stake, and the fact that in this country, uh, it's the only place in the world where tremendous amounts of money are made from sick people. Mm. And from fudged data, hmm. and the FDA doesn't do all that well, uh, and they fight a losing battle because anybody who's a good biostatistician is going to work for a drug company, and it's a great big, it's an enormous, it's a public health problem. Yeah, the cheating, cheating in medical research is a public health problem, and should be treated like a public health problem, and I wouldn't have said that. 10 years ago, or from all my other stuff, I, I was much more thought that numbers would you know, help bring us the truth. And that's true. Um, it's, it's, easy to, although the, it's easy to lie with numbers, but it's even easier to lie with words. There's still, you know, <laughs> that's a good okay. quote. I like you that one. You can see the lies better yeah. you know, than with words. Um, uh, but but uh, that really, of course, my can you know, skepticism strongly about the routine falsity of of a lot of research on human beings. You, you did you did a very in depth analysis that I learned a lot from uh, of the space shuttle disasters, and there I would say that it wasn't greed or an attempt to um, lie, but just people went a little astray in how they presented information and it with terrible consequences. Could you explain like to the people who don't know about this example, uh, what went you wrong know, there? I worked uh, in uh, the third book, I have the Challenger, which was I basically have Richard Feynman's take on Challenger. And uh, I wish I could, well, I was that sharp. <laughs> <laughs> it was really something. And he tells a great story about it in one of the, you know. Yeah. Uh, but my own independent work was on um, the um, uh, the second accident, uh, the, uh, the the Challenger and Columbia. the other one. Um, and I got right after it went down. I got all the fly, uh, so I was injured um, uh, when um, uh, uh, at at launch when a piece of foam broke and hit the wing right. on the launch and made a hole the size of a basketball. And it flew for two weeks with a hole in its wing because there's no air up there. Who cares, yeah. Who cares, yep. And, and they knew there was a problem. They may have known quite well by, nobody ever says, but it may have been that a spy plane took a picture of that wing. Mm. But they don't want to express <laughs> the resolution, you know, say what the resolution is and stuff. Sure. But they, they knew there was a problem. And they did a, engineers on about the fifth day did a big 
PowerPoint presentation. I got that about a week after the Columbia went down. I got it uh, via a uh, information, you know, federal government information thing that a reporter had done, and I got the slides. And I don't know anything about rocket science, but I know a lot about the relationship between evidence and conclusions. And that wasn't what they were doing was perfectly clear to spot. Um, uh, and I take the key slide apart, and you know they're in trouble because they're measuring things in cubic inches. <laughs> in trouble right there. <laughs> There's a fame the two two cell two things crashed into Mars because of right. nothing at that straight there. But these guys were in cubic inches. But on one slide, they abbreviated cubic inches three different ways. Wow. If they were sophomores at MIT and the graduate student was grading their paper, graduate student would write on the thing, have you thought about, um, have you thought about um, uh, insurance sales as a career? <laughs> <laughs> because that, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just a sign of something's really wrong here that, that they, they can't get units of measurement right in, in three, three different ways of writing it on one page, you know, and none of them were inches cubed. They were in CU, just, you know, amateur. Yeah. And they, they have some models and they test it and so, but it all gives it, gives it away right there that they, this is, they, 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 they don't, they don't have the material to, to make a decision that everything is okay. Mm. That's what they said. Everything's okay. And it was right there if you saw it, you know, especially if you knew it was an accident. Yeah. But it's absolutely. So I did that on my own. I got a hit call from Boeing <laughs> and that they, they had trademark on this or copyright or something. And I said, well, it was gotten by a, you know, government thing or so. Um, and the commission that investigated it published in their final report, which is the 100-page summary of all this stuff, uh, my an analysis of that slide. And it said, we've got to stop engineering by PowerPoint. And it turns out all the documentation of every project at NASA is done in PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. There's no technical reports. They used to do beautiful technical reports. They were famous for sure. them. You know, like 10 pagers and stuff. And so they use it as a general attack on engineering by PowerPoint. But the point for me is that they, the, sh the shuttle people investigating, who were a pretty fancy group investigating the accident, picked up on what I said. Well, that... And I don't know anything about rocket science, but I know what the hell, I have a more powerful skill, but I can tell the difference, you know, between the relationship the rela I know about, I can understand the relationship between evidence and conclusion. And that's a different thing than knowing rocket science. <laughs> because it's, mo it's more general. Yeah. Broader. Well, that's uh, very, it's very interesting because I know that, you know, you've said you've criticized PowerPoint before very trenchantly. And I'll, I'll confess, I use PowerPoint all the time when I give talks. But I guess uh, I would never think to use it to sort of share information as text that makes no documents. sense yeah 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 um i had a wonderful thing happen very early on about powerpoint which i didn't hear about until 15 years later so the powerpoint essay comes out and it has the columbia in it and among other things and it was called the cogniti style of powerpoint and it had a picture of stalin giving a talk <laughs> <laughs> and, and the people down below you know, all the soldiers waiting down below making remarks about his bad PowerPoint. And I, somebody, somebody read that essay before it was published and said, why don't you say what you should do instead of just saying, you know, bad PowerPoint. And I first, I got kind of stunned. I said, my job's not to rescue PowerPoint. <laughs> and I thought, well, but I should rescue my audience, my people. And so I wrote one page in, which is, Every meeting should begin with a handout that uses sentences, um, two to six pages using sentences, no bullets. And every meeting begins with a 30-minute reading period. Mm. And 
It's how I taught. They confused uh, Ivy League undergraduates about <laughs> we actually had to think in class. In class, oh my goodness. In class, we had to think. That was, yes. They were used to scribble. They were very good at scribbling notes, but they had. And so if I had a proof on the board, I would pass the proof out. So they didn't have to take notes, and then they could annotate how I got from step three to step four, you know, mark that up. If they, and and so they weren't in doing stenography anymore, you know. So a few months after that came out, Jeff Bezos and his uh, direct assistant were flying, reading aloud my essay on PowerPoint. And they saw that set of sentences, six pages and they immediately adopted it. They okay. threw out PowerPoint, and the highest level decision making was made by the. There was no. There, there was no presentation. There was no rehearsal or no slide. There was the six six pager. People can read that faster than you can talk, and so I have my courses. People got all five books, and there was reading all during the class. I mean, talk a lot too, but. We would stop and read these two pages, and then I'd talk about it, so on. And so it was back and forth of them reading different mode, mm. and they could read, they could skip things they're not interested in. See, with slides, everybody has the same slide at once, and it's controlled by the... But with reading, everybody in the room can use their own priorities and their own sense of relevance with that. And so all the work of preparation went into the report, and a team might even do that six pager and then they discuss it for an hour and a half and he says it gave us an enormous competitive advantage and he said these they, they wrote about this 15 years later it gave us a tremendous competitive advantage an order of magnitude competitive advantage they said this method uh that everything that we won on went through this method and they just went batshit over <laughs> this i didn't know about i was feeling Bullied by Microsoft and Boeing and stuff, and you know, the people doing saying bad things about me and stuff. And here, Jeff Bezos was, you know, the Amazon was doing this and thinking it was the greatest thing in the world. It was unbelievable. And I would have felt very comfortable and not so paranoid and threatened <laughs> if I'd known, you know, I could have told that story, but it or, didn't or, come out. Or maybe before. they could have slid you 1% for the profits. <laughs> well, that's another point, which is. I patented a medical interface a long, long time ago, but I decided to make everything open source. I thought about Sparklines mm -hmm. doing that, and I, I had a patent lawyer who could who said they could do anything, they could patent anything. Microsoft patented Sparklines, but they didn't. They, oh. uh, and they used it as a trademark. <laughs> Stole it. But my view is I'm open source. Yeah. And also... I'm doing just fine on, on all these books and all this teaching. Sure. I don't, I don't need, I, I don't like that. I, I, I like the ideas. I'm so happy to get the ideas out. Yeah. And so hearing that Amazon was using this to great success and every, lots of other people, that you know, that that made me so happy that well, it had consequences. And the thing about meetings, uh, I mean, this this goes a little bit beyond the visual display of information, right? I mean, this is this is a kind of a way of thinking, right? I mean, and then the PowerPoint critique gets into that as well. So uh, is, is there a future book that has nothing to do with data visualization? <laughs> um, well, you just exposed that I have uh, volume six. Uh, and uh, Don't mean to give it away. I can tell you the title. Presenting, Analyzing, Data, slash information. Hmm. Smarter communications, shorter meetings, content, credibility, clarity, efficiency, honesty. Oh, very good. Part two, how to evaluate presentations, how to make presentations. So it's both from the consumer and the producer point of view. See, so they're both thinking about credibility and content, consumer and producer. Uh, and then the second uh, uh, piece of this two chapter thing is data analysis, visualization, and the truth. Mm. And this is a sort of short course in ET. Okay. Those those titles report. It turns out presentation means 
kind of everything. You could say it's like a medical report. You could tell it's, it's you know, but uh, it's it's focused on both the production and consumption and the interplay between the producer and consumer. Well, it's 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 crucially important in the modern world, right? There's so yes. much information, so much content. Our attention is so very important, and there's there has to be huge inefficiencies that we haven't quite figured out yet. I mean, I know when I go hear someone give a lecture, seminar, or colloquium in physics, and it's an hour long, I will absolutely learn more from talking to them one-on-one -on -one for five or 10 minutes than I will from an hour long presentation. And it's because you can, can control, yes, you have, you I guess find so. out what's relevant. I yep. guess so. So, I mean, but is there, how do you, how do you make that scale? I mean, I don't always have uh, access to the presenter myself for even 10 minutes. Um, I write about efficiency. It's in the title. And uh, one of the principles is uh, um, uh, show up early and finish early, the presenter. Show up early, chat people up, get them, get, get, get them to start reading the document. Yeah. And finish your role. They'll be thrilled. No one ever wished the meeting longer. Thrilled. <laughs> the other thing is a good six pager can pretty well do it. Hmm. I have thought times of, hey, read this and just say a little bit. And for my class, I do that. It's all there. Read it. They can read twice as fast, at least, as you can talk. And they can choose what they read instead of the damn bullets. They can choose what's important to them. And everybody's reading differently. That it's it's a tremendous advantage to instead of clicking through the slides too fast, too slow, too boring, they can skip paragraphs, they can go, Oh, here's what I want. Right. They can mark it up. They can, you know, they can read it twice. They can check, you know, something back. They can mark it up and then Oh, there's still a few minutes. Let me see now. This was good. This is good. I don't have to worry about that. So, and, you know, you could at some places uh, say, anybody uh, want to discuss this? People won't dare put their <laughs> hand up. <laughs> no, no, but except people who always. Right. There are some right? who always do. Yeah. Yeah. I have a strategy about people who ask questions, which is uh, sort of this. The uh, you think about the priorities of all the other people in the audience, the person they'd most like to hear talk are themselves. Mm -hmm. I agree. Secondly, they'd like to hear me. <laughs> the people they'd least like to hear talk are their fellow audience members. So on that principle, I decide I'll talk. You can do handle the questions in maybe under 20 people. It's more of a discussion like yeah. a you know, in a little classroom or maybe 25, but it gets, when you, if you get over, if you get over 30, you have now have people sitting in front who are people who ask questions at everything, you know, they're professional and they're, it's often a, they have some other cause and, you know, uh, or it's obvious or, you know, it does. And we're wasting the time of, you know, the other N minus the N minus one people in the room. Especially if N is big, you know, if there's 300 people in a yeah. lecture, you just can't do it. Um, it uh, uh, it's not a discussion. It's these little mini speeches often. Um, or they saw maybe one in 10 has some kind of grievance. Say, so, yeah, I've used PowerPoint for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um that strategy I just mentioned is in in this essay about the audience and questions yeah. and about the priorities of the audience. I think that's a very convincing argument about priorities of your audience. Who would you like to hear talking? You're, you can't talk yourself. They, they want to hear the presenter. Yeah, it's a very it's a very big question for the modern world, how we share information and how we choose and what our timescales are and our methods. And I, and I don't think that we're very good at it yet. So I'm glad to see you pushing to at least try to get better in that direction. You've got to, uh, because there's so much stuff. You've got so to, much stuff. You've got to, the other thing is there's some good research on ignoring things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and being self-aware of ignoring and being self-deliberately ignoring this. Um, I wish I could do that 
when I look at Twitter. <laughs> I get You're not away alone. A whole after, don't, not that word, don't say it. I can throw away a whole afternoon, you know, poking around. And it's kind of interesting. It's just interesting enough. Just interesting enough. Oh, how are the Warriors doing? You know, <laughs> they have a game tonight. I know. How are they? And, and uh, it requires, it's often beyond my self-discipline. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. I charged it away from my bed. Okay, good. I put my phone in the kitchen. We have to trick ourselves. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and the relationship between art and science here is fascinating (laughs) because as a, as a scientist, you know, I like to think that a theoretical physicist, we're trying to construct a theory, a model, we're working toward that. But as an artist, it's more of a craft. There's, you know, rules for this or suggestions or whatever. And I'm wondering if you think of your own work in visualizing information as being articulations of a single underlying theory or as just learning in a more piecemeal way and, and trying to use our judgment along the way? Um, the smart aleck answer and half true is that inspiration is for amateurs and the rest of us just go to the studio every day and go to work. <laughs> and I see my art as uh well, what it has in common with real science is intense seeing and understanding that intensity brings some understanding and then the ability to change and work from it and so on. Uh, and everything serious requires, um, unless you're supremely talented like Picasso, requires um, uh, a, uh, a series of steps, of change, of discovering the material in art as, as you, you have an idea. And I can tell within about half an hour whether this is going to work out or not. Mm-hmm. And I have learned if I can't find promise for the half an hour, is I call my backhoe operator in and say, bury that because I don't, it's, it's not going to work. Yeah. It's going to waste time that, you know, I could. I know this is going to work. It's not working now, but I know it will. And um, and then it's trying to avoid words of not saying it looks like Picasso. It looks like Stonehenge. It's a piece of stone. And so I see it for its traits, not its, not what it's, its name, but its color, its texture. Mm-hmm. And the very special thing about sculpture and about physics is air is a material (laughs) space (laughs) absolutely you know the only two things in that in that world are 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 sculptures air is a material and and space is a material for in physics yeah and that's uh i'm not quite sure what that means but well it is thinking about air as a material that's what sculptors do when I'm working with my colleagues on a piece, probably half our comments are about airspace. Mm. And it's it's like figure ground on paper. That's that's trivial. That's just flatland design. That's so that's I wrote a whole book about escape called it basically escaping flatland. And that's when I knew I was graphic design was easy because it was flatland. <laughs> The really hard stuff is you've got air as a material and it's vague and it changes from every perspective on every kind of light and every kind of sky, of, you know, and, and whether it's raining or not. And so there's such a multiplicity of things out there to sort among and make decisions about. Um, but it's, I don't call it, it's not craft, it's a kind of, of the technical name of doing a piece is... Uh, Disjointed incrementalism, okay, otherwise known as muddling through. <laughs> uh, they're small steps; they're kind of separate steps. It's it is a muddling through. It's trying things out. Uh, it has uh, a clear stopping point. Um, in the work, I find it at the end of the the first kind of ending, the end of maybe a day or a couple of days of work. I think it's really great. Hmm. And I believe that fairly strongly. And I get up the next morning and see three things wrong. 
and I'm willing to change my mind, but there's something I have to, I have to believe in it for a while and, and defend it, you know? Yeah. And, and then gather myself with uh, fresh eyes, sometimes the next morning, um, uh, or the, you know, maybe even the next day. And we said, we got to do this now and got to try that. Um, and, and that's especially the case because I locate the art. That is, I have 234 acres of my own sculpture, and it shows for only my sculpture. And we have backhoes and we make ridges. And no other artist has control of the space, mm. of the land. Richard Serra gets a few hundred, to maybe 500 square feet in front of a building laid out by an architect, and they say, that's where you're going to put your piece. And this, I have control of the landscape, of the trees, of their seven ridges, ups and downs, the location. We can change it. I usually will change it maybe after six months or some better space. And all of that is now completely changing the air, too. There is a material. And so it's just like in self-publishing my books or have complete control. There's no bureaucracy. There's no, uh, thanks to the books, I've been able to pay for all the sculpture stuff. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, there, I do big landscape pieces. You know, they're, the market for landscape, abstract landscape uh, uh, art is like the market for, for Canadian experimental poetry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big market, uh, which is actually good because I'm free of pitching to rich people about why they should do it. Good. It, it, so that's the same thing with making the books. There's no bureaucracy. There's no editor. There's no editorial board. There's no, uh, I, I choose the printer. I work directly with. So it's all this hands-on thing that is combined with the mind. And those are, those two, it's those two things that have really helped me because it's, there's no, there are, there are no middle people. Yeah. There are no assistant deans. Uh, universities have become bizarre in the last 15, 20 years uh, with the deputy assistant provost and, and endless, uh, they, it, I have a law of university growth, which is the doubling time of the bureaucracy is 12 years, mm. during which time the number of faculty and students remains constant. It's astonishing the rate of that. Yeah. Well, the doubling time. That's it, it. It's something like <laughs> that. Yeah, that's right. I do want to give you a chance to, to talk about one other artistic thing, which is the Feynman diagram. Oh, I, yes. I, oh. I love the, all the Feynman diagrams in your new book. And, you know, the audience can't see, but as I'm as we're talking to each other, there are Feynman diagrams behind you. Well, what is it that make I love Feynman diagrams, but why do you love them as much? Um, I grew up in Beverly Hills, or I went to high school, and uh, I never knew Feynman. I never went to a talk, but um, a couple of my friends went to Caltech. I found out about his uh, physics textbook, the three volume. Uh, yeah. And so that was kind of introduction. And he has a very, the QED book is very good. It's mainly in English. It's four lectures he gave. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are lots of Feynman diagrams. And they're a miracle about, uh, you know, you get the 17th significant digit accurate in, in theory and practice and so on. And so that one and the green, the the fourth book, a, lot, a whole a lot of Feynman. And then I, here's how I started making the sculptures. I made a huge rocket, 80 feet long, with an airstream trailer on the end, and it's like in launch position only. It's at an angle. It might it's a sculpture of mine, big sculpture, rocket science three, and it has lights inside and a rotating TV antenna in an airstream trailer, with wheels and all this. And it's quite prankish. And I showed it in front of Fermilab, along with Feynman's van. Mm -hmm. I paid $10,000 to have Feynman's vans repaired. They brought it in, and they brought my just my Airstream trailer in, which I didn't, I didn't bring the rocket in. It's 80 feet long. And put it in front <laughs> of Fermilab. And I, I had a big show of things. And the Department of Energy uh, cabinet member came and loved them. And so they bought a bunch of them. And they, they're at Fermilab. 
I first used them on that Airstream trailer. It's going, you know, to some other place. And the aliens or the, the people, for the, whoever they are, far away, they're not going to understand what the NASA logo was or uh, the flag. Mm. People understand Feynman diagrams. Interesting. And they'll say the people inside are pretty smart <laughs> because <laughs> it's universal. It's universal. And, you know, there's, there, there's probably Feynman diagrams all kinds of places because they're based on nature's laws. And in some days it'll just a little code of it and and so on. And so it and so it was a lovely prank. And I just put three Feynman diagrams on the side and they cast shadows on the aluminum thing and it looked beautiful. They're also beautiful, that's the thing, right. And this turned out to be the G minus two or something mm -hmm. things that was, came out just a year or two ago. That was an accident. I, <laughs> I chose these because they were 10th order and they were the coolest ones. And a guy had printed you know, like 500 of them. There's thousands and thousands. <laughs> but these are, I believe, 10th order Feynman diagrams. And it happened to come up with the I don't know, something that was minus two. G minus two of the muon, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. A way to f find new physics, right. Yes. Um, and I showed that at, uh, at Fermilab about three or four years ago. And um, that was kind of scary because, you know, <laughs> they actually knew what these, these were, you know, understood them. Um, and one of them said, uh, uh, complained about one of the things, for, you know, that was maybe un, not, not appropriate. If, you know, he said, what's, what's that? And I had prepared and, uh, um, and I had said, uh, well, you guys divide by zero. <laughs> 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 and yeah, but we divide zero by zero, so it's maybe it's okay. <laughs> oh, maybe it's, well, I should have said okay. Uh, uh, and then Feynman's hundredth birthday, the Nobel Foundation took them on, or the Nobel Library, some that uh, took them on some tour. They went to Hong Kong, and then COVID came. Yeah, okay. They went for his hundredth hundredth anniversary of Feynman. Right, and. That was, uh, I didn't go to the opening, unfortunately. I, I, it was just too much. To, yeah. I'd already seen them, but the pictures were wonderful. And that, that just made me so happy. You know, <laughs> they were out there and, you know, and the, the, the secret of them is to make them, raise them about two, two to three inches off the surface. Then they cast shadows. Yeah. And they're the most amazing things because you have a couple of perpendicular things coming out that pull them away, which create now a, a, a space going backwards to the wall, from the metal to the wall by those posts. And they, they look, the, the shadows look three-dimensional because of the light. And then, of course, the shadows change as the sun goes by. Mm -hmm. And so they just are totally alive and always different because the shadows are strong often and along with the silvery part. And, and this is a sign of a really good art piece, was that you get all kinds of amazing things for free. That's my favorite expression about a piece of art. It's not true of all. That is, things you didn't plan on at all, but when it was raining, it did something magical, or when there was butter light with sunrise and sunset, it did something magical with the butter light of sunrise and sunset. And I call that, this is all for free. <laughs> and that's such a wonderful thing to make a piece that you can say that about. You can't say that about, you can say that about a lot of outdoor pieces because you've got rain and shadow and, diff and the light and the earth rotating, all, all of that. And all those things were for free and, and completely un un unfathomable until you actually see them. You know, the combination of a, shadow, but it's also raining and, or dogs running by and there's this and that. And that's a way of a good piece of art. And you never say that against, against a, fl on a flat on the wall. Hmm. Hmm. It's the dead same, the optical experience. You may be able to see different things somewhat, but not this stuff you get for free every day you see us. So this gives you free, fresh eyes. I have a flat painting, say, on the in, inside, 
after a, a month, I don't even see it anymore. Yeah. I have to move it. These things, the pieces out here, are they're always alive. They're always different. I'm always happy to see them. Yeah, and I, I like rain the best. <laughs> the rain makes the, the rust and the, the iron and the, and the stone you know, warm, have this nice, warm, luscious, luscious color to them. Plus, the stone looks great. You know when it's wet. Well, I mean, this this forces me to ask one one more thing, and then then we can wrap it up, which is the importance of the time domain uh, to everything that you're talking about. Uh, I mean, you're making the point that these kinds of works of art, even though they're stationary, they interact with their environment in such a way that at different times they give you different experiences. But you've also really emphasized, even in the data visualization world, the importance of when you collect the data and the importance of when you present the data. And maybe this is yet another frontier that people need to think about. I think the best idea in the new book is the following. You never learn more about a process than when you watch the original measurements being made. <laughs> that came from a great applied statistician with a lovely name, Cuthbert Daniel, uh, who did industrial statistics. And so add a little more sulfur and, you know, step 34, that's industrial, and he do little experiments. And it was incredibly smart, MIT, et cetera. And he did applied work. And made it, it was a famous consultant for on drugs, but on industrial processes. And we wrote a paper together about uh, the FDA. And he told me that. And he said, here's an example. General Electric put PCBs in the Hudson River, and uh, they spent billions trying to make up for it. And they had to do testing every day of how, through how good the water was and report to the EPA. And so let's go out in a little boat to make a test. And it's a guy in a little small boat, and he's got kind of a, a, you know, a cup on the end of a stick. And... He leans over out of the boat to take a sample, and he leans over to the side where the water's cleaning. <laughs> the statisticians maliciously call that the sampling to please. <laughs> the only time when you can see that is when you're watching the measurement. Right. You're there. And I have come to play in many people's backyards I watched three heart surgeries at the Cleveland Clinic, um, one open heart, um, two robotic. I saw all of NASA's toys, play in other people's backyard. And I did a, a section in uh, about being at, po at the point of measurement in the book. And I did an interview um, about once every six weeks with a ICU and emergency room nurse. Mm -hmm for four years, before five years now, before the epidemic, because she was my hairdresser. And for an hour and a half, I would just ask her a question, and another question, and just listen and prompt, prompting. And see when there's when the, the system variance is zero, you can use it, you, can, you need an N of one. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a cool point. So she was talking about uh, drawing blood. She's talking about all drawing blood. Uh -huh. There isn't much variation. You're going to hear most of most everything in this one sample of size one. Okay. And that's a very good way. And and it's accidental. She's come to me. It's not any kind of drawing. You know, it's not any kind of cherry picking. It's just convenient. It's just, and I learned so much from her of the general system of how it worked. I'm not there in the, in the ICU with her, but I am asking questions mm -hmm. in the emergency room now. And you know, you think, okay, this is happening in every emergency room in the country. You know, they're totally jammed up and these things happen and they're hallways filled with gurneys and, and stuff. And it's better than shows and anecdotes See, because we're having this observer who's just t telling us what's going on, you know? And that, I think, is the best idea in the whole book. And it's, it's in my spirit of being hands-on. Yeah. And, and instead of these guys writing the 
500th way to do such and such, a logistic regression is what everybody uses, go out and watch how the stuff's measuring. Get out on the field and watch the measurements and your, your, the scales will fall from your eyes. You're assuming these observations are independent? <laughs> <laughs> There's a I saying mean, in physics that no one believes a theory more than the theorist who proposed it, and no one is more skeptical of data than the experimentalist who collected it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> Because they know the dirty stuff. <laughs> exactly. I mean, even that's probably the most important reason why we do labs in undergraduate physics. So you know that it's not a completely clean, uh, painless experience to collect that data. There's some, there's some things that happen that you should be aware of. It's because you often, the person doing it often knows the right answer. Mm. That's the, um, I don't the, you know, the, you're seeing measurement error right, right from the start yeah. in a way. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, Edward Tufty, thanks so much. I think you've given us a lot to think about and new ways of thinking in a, in a very information rich world that we live in today. Oh, well, thank you. I, I love doing this. Good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good. Take care. Bye.